Start investing in gold and silver today at sdbullion.com and join the over 35,000 precious metal investors who have made the switch to the lowest gold and silver prices in the industry. SD Bullion recently claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500, making them one of the fastest growing bullion companies in the United States. With low bullion prices and over the top customer service, SD Bullion is setting the standard for precious metals transactions. Visit www.sdbullion.com today and start saving on every precious metals purchase you make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com, and with us today is Brother John F. from the Silver for the People blog. John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be back on, Elijah. Thanks. All right. Well, did you want to give our viewers an update on the precious metal markets in the last couple months and then also where you see them heading in for 2017? Well, we've seen unusual strengthening in the U.S. dollar. Uh, so... You know, whenever you talk about gold and silver, you have to talk about whatever respective currency that you're talking about. Uh, so, if, for example, if you're talking about the Venezuelan Bolivar, then um, it's a runaway bull market, of course. And I think uh, recently um, it was either Dave Kranzler or I think it was maybe Rory from the Daily Coin mentioned that uh, some missionary had said that uh, you could buy six months of food for one ounce of silver in Venezuela. So it's always based on the country that you're in. We just happen to be in the country that has the strongest currency in the world, and that's the US dollar. Now, why is that the case? Is it that last man standing effect? Uh, is it because the market is sensing that there's an interest rate cycle increase coming? And strong interest rates often are, not always are, but often are uh, good for a currency because foreigners are attracted to the higher rates, et cetera. So, uh, or is it just the old conspiracy of uh, the basic rigors of the market in precious metals keeping the price down? Uh, gold is really trying to test that $1,100 price in U.S. dollars. And that's really going to be a key price because uh, if you draw in the trend lines and also if you draw in like a, a percentage correction line, then right in that area between 1080 and 1100 is about a 50% correction from the run-up of 250 or so to 1900. And that's also a key crossover for one of the oldest trend lines, not the oldest, but one of the oldest since the beginning of this bull market. And that would possibly change the definition for me, at least it, it's relative for everyone, but whether this is a bull or a bear market, some people say we've been in a bear market in gold for quite some time. So gold is uh, coming up to that key test of 1100, 1080. And silver, of course, has been cracked really hard. It's still struggling to get out of the mid-teens. Uh, so silver has actually taken the biggest hit of all. And it, I don't really see a lot of downside for silver. There could be a buck or two. But uh, it's pretty much had everything taken out of it. So then I guess what you're saying is that it looks like we're seeing a bottom for both the metals right now? Uh, well, I can't say that we're seeing a bottom. I'm really going to be watching the 1080-1100 price for gold because of such a techni key technical support level there. Uh, I think gold has a potential of falling farther than silver if we do get a drop. I'm certainly not going to rule it out. Uh, I would say that it would be a phenomenal buy. I would be tempted to buy gold around 1000 or under. But uh, silver, I think you can pick up right now and probably only a dollar or so cheaper. Um, but again, this is going to be tied in probably with interest rate cycles, Trump presidency, uh, and exactly what's going to happen, which is we really don't know at this point. So speaking of interest rates, what was your perspective on the Fed rate hike just recently and how it impacted the markets? 
I think the markets read it as still being dovish, but at least the cycle is starting. Uh, I think there was some serious doubts as to whether or not we were going to go into a Japanese type of permanent sort of deflationary zero rates. And I think there is some relief that that's not going to be the case. But then again, it was not very aggressive at all. Just just little tiny moves and hinting at little tiny moves in the future. Very tentative. So I think the stock market took that uh, to be very bullish. And uh, that was somewhat bearish for the metals. Now, traditionally, you have the saying, you know, three steps and a stumble. And I don't know if those sort of rules hold because we've been out of a traditional market environment for so long. But traditionally, three interest rate increases by the Federal Reserve would indicate a the beginning of a bear market in stocks, simply because when bonds go into a bear market, obviously, uh, the price of bonds are inversely correlated to interest rates. So as interest rates rise, when bonds fall, uh, stocks become less attractive because there's a competitor for them. And we definitely need a competitor for stocks. Uh, the, the situation with the pension funds is horrible right now. And they're still making 7 and 8% yield assumptions, which is utterly absurd. But it would be good for retirees and for people on fixed incomes to be able to invest in something that actually has a real yield. We're not anywhere near there yet, but uh, there, we do seem to be in the beginning stages of a process of normalization of interest rates. So you mentioned how normally if there were you know, a couple of rate hikes, that would be bearish for the stock market. What are the reasons for why the stock market isn't falling right now? It's, it's hitting all-time highs. You know, the Dow is nearly 20,000 points. What is your perspective on this? Well, we... We can't go by, we certainly can't be certain about going by historical precedents because those have kind of been thrown out the window with a zero interest rate environment. But historically, the there's been the rule of, th like I said, three steps and a stumble. The Fed raises interest rates and makes uh, fixed income more attractive, which pulls money out of the stock market. But one of the reasons why you have that rule, why you don't get an immediate sell-off in stocks, is that one of the reasons traditionally that the Fed starts raising rates is because the economy is looking better, the economy is looking healthy. Obviously, an, a healthy economy is good for the fundamentals of stocks. Now, I would argue against both because I don't think there really are very good fundamentals for stocks. I think they're very overvalued here based on a price earnings, price to sales, price to book, just about any valuation you can pick. But traditionally, uh, people have read the first few rate increases as being bullish, and uh, you have stocks going up in the face of that. But once the Fed continues to raise rates, then at some point, st stocks turn down they sort of follow the uh, bond market down. So I'd like to discuss a little bit about uh, another topic, uh, you know, kind of relating to the stock market a little bit. You know, we, we've we seen the stock market, you know, continue to go up ever since uh, the election and the big upset of Trump winning. What is your perspective on, you know, this upset that did occur? It basically caught all uh, the mainstream experts, quote unquote experts by surprise, that Trump actually ended up winning the presidency. What is your perspective on this upset and what do you think it'll bring for the economy? Well, it didn't catch me by surprise. I predicted it pretty much for a year, even as soon as he announced, just because there was actually some type of even theoretical alternative to the hegemonic uh, system that we've had so far. And, you know, everybody was an insider. Is Trump really an outsider? I have no idea. But even the chance that he is an outsider was enough to get people to vote for him. And, of course, the the mainstream media, the onslaught of opposition against him, whether it was the media, the educational establishment, his own party, the other party, basically everybody was against him, which gave him an 
an underdog status. Uh, Trump didn't really run on traditional conservative principles. I'm not really sure if he really is a conservative. Uh, part of his policy seems to be protectionist. That's not really traditionally a conservative uh, idea. But because we've had such bastardized trade policies, the the reaction, the populist reaction against things like NAFTA, GATT, the WTO, and things like that swung a lot of that sentiment towards him. Uh, what What is he going to do in the future? Uh, I've said before, I think he would be very smart to keep his cards uh, held very close to his chest until he's in office to prevent people from uh, trying to front run whatever he's going to do. I don't think he can trust the Congress. It's very clear that the Republicans are Republicans in name only. They're really part of one gigantic big government party that includes the Democrats, the Republicans, and this corporatocracy that we have. And of course, then this gigantic media complex of Twitter, Google, Facebook, et cetera, that seem to be very politicized organizations as well. So he took pretty much all of those on and won, but what he's going to do now, I really have no idea. I think he may back off on some of some of the things that he promised. Uh, is he going to try some infrastructure build out? I don't know. Where is he going to get the money for that? He's definitely in a very difficult spot. A lot of people have said that he may end up being a Herbert Hoover. But who knows? He may, may have some aces up his sleeve that we don't know about. Um, I think Paul Krugman is now complaining that He's got gold bugs and conspiracy nuts on his cabinet. He's appointed some interesting folks, we'll say that. So everything's on hold until we see what he actually does in his first 100 days. No, it's really interesting how he really took on the establishment, um, at, at least acted as if he was uh, taking on the establishment, and he, everyone seemed to be against him, and including, like you said, the mainstream media. What is your perspective on... You know, because you and I run kind of alternative media websites um, and also Silver Doctors is an alternative uh, independent media website. So what is your perspective on the attack that it seems like there's been from, you know, the mainstream of calling us, you know, just spreading fake news, Russian propaganda and all those labels and stuff. And then also how Trump has really delegitimized the mainstream media. It's really true. I mean, I personally think they're dying. And these are kind of last gasp, really pathetic attempts. Um, fake news. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous. And then to bring on Snopes, which is anybody who's done any research knows that that's a couple of liberals sitting in their basement trying to tell us what the real facts are. The same thing with Wikipedia and all of these biased sources. So it amounts to an argument from authority. They want you to believe that they're the authority. I think we had something like that earlier proposed with Hillary Clinton proposed something about uh, being able to define who a reporter really is. And of course, that's all nonsense. We know that the Constitution guarantees freedom of the press, and the government doesn't give you a press credential. That would defeat the entire purpose of it. So I think they're desperate. And as I pointed out before, we've seen revolutions in in our country in certain businesses based on the just radical destructive effect that the Internet has had. I've mentioned the post office. There's Craigslist. There's all sorts of effects. There's Amazon.com. Who would have guessed that people would be ordering? I know we pretty much order everything online and have it delivered, uh, that it, such an effect would happen. It's also possible that the banks would disappear and cryptocurrencies would replace them. And it's possible that the mainstream media as we know it would go away. If you look in history, the traditional way of controlling public opinion was when you had the William Randolph Hearst of the world would go around and buy up all the newspapers. It used to be that the newspapers in America were these independent uh, sort of hometown 
operations where you had uh, in your town or city, you had a conservative journal and then a, a fairly liberal uh, paper and people, they'd kind of compete, but it was basically sort of local control. And then we saw a consolidation of buying up of those. And now we have Reuters type news feeds. We have feeds that are given to all the news organizations. They all uh, parrot the same line. And of course, we know all the stories of fake reporting on the Iraq war. We have fake reporting all over the place with the news media. We've got some fakers in government in NASA. We, I mean, you know, the purpose of having a free press is to call out liars in government. That's the reason why the framers of the Constitution created a free press, because they recognized that was one of the checks, and they put many, many checks in the Constitution to prevent tyrannical power from taking hold. And a free press is one of those. So this is a this is a counterattack by the controlled media, which is controlled by big money. Uh, I don't think that the framers of the Constitution could have foreseen the type of economic control. I don't think they would have even tried to combat it because there really isn't any way, except to just guarantee that their competitors could also speak, which is what they're so incensed about because to bring it full circle, that's how Donald Trump won the election. Uh, he won it through tweeting. He won it through grassroots campaigns. He, run it, he won it through uh, traditional stump speech making and and through the internet. And I think they're, they're smarting about it. They don't like it. And uh, they got shown up. So do you see, I guess, what do you see for the future? You said um, that it looks like the mainstream media is dying. What do you see for the future of if there's going to be, you know, more government control over free speech or um, what do you see for the future of the alternative media? I think the alternative media needs to adopt alternative means of support, and that would include alternative currencies like cryptocurrencies, alternative forms of advertising, possibly even alternative jurisdictions perhaps locating in a more free speech friendly jurisdiction, whether that means using servers in Iceland, uh, having sort of a WikiLeaks model or something like that. I don't really see them having the ability to shut things down without bringing in a world government because we still have competing jurisdictions, we still have competing currencies, and the internet just makes it that much easier to locate, you know, you can, you can locate your web servers in any country that you want and you can repoint your dns you can do a lot of things to move you can have backups mirrors etc if you look at how, how difficult it's been for them to shut down torrents uh, you've got people making mirrors they shut down kick-ass torrents but the pirate bay is still up extra torrent is still up people people are still downloading torrents and sharing movie files it's very very difficult because the internet is such a disruptive technology and then when you bring in things like encryption which you know is spreading already in regards to email in regards to surfing through vpns and things like that so many of these technologies are really the horse is out of the barn with them already. I, I don't see them having the ability to put the genie back in the bottle. The only way they can really reassert control in my mind would be to force some type of world government. And that may be their plan. I think that that's going to be very difficult for them to do. And they are going to have to have buy-in from the up-and-comers like China and the rest of Asia. Why should they sacrifice their day in the sun, which Britain had and various empires in Europe had and then the United States had and Russia had? Why should China sacrifice their time of wealth and prosperity where they can have a reserve currency backed by gold and they can benefit from all of the seniorage, et cetera, that comes with having a world reserve currency. So it's going to be difficult to get the buy-in to get a monolithic world government 
I think we just had the conviction of Christine Lagarde, which is a big uh, black eye for the IMF and the World Bank and all those people. Uh, I think they're a little bit overrated in how powerful they are. I think Jim Rickards thinks they're more powerful than they are, and but I, I really don't. I don't buy it. But perhaps China is going to buy into that thing. We'll just have to wait and see. All right. Well, Brother John F., thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. Before we let you go, are there any last thoughts you'd like to add? And where can our viewers find you online? Absolutely. They can find me on brotherjohnf.com. That is the public blog. They can also click a link and go to the private member site, brotherjohnf.biz, where they can sign up and uh, pay monthly or a yearly fee. And that's uh, a site where I release a silver update or a member update about every three days for members. I just like to leave people with the thought that they need to still keep in front of their minds eye the fact that silver and gold and and perhaps some cryptocurrency is really going to be the only thing that can protect you if we get the sort of crisis that we've seen kind of rolling around the world. Venezuela is a really terrible place right now, but we saw things in Greece, we saw things in Cyprus, and now we're seeing a terrible clampdown in India. Uh, all the people who lived through those crises would have been much better off if they had protection in the form of assets that are outside of the control of these central authorities, even if it's just enough to weather the storm I, I think everybody needs to consider that, that it could come here. Right now, the U.S. is looking very strong with the currency being very strong. Rates are going up. Stocks are going up. But we just don't know how long we have before a crisis comes here. And I do believe the crisis is coming to our shores and fairly soon. Once again, Brother John F., thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Elijah. Great to be on. 